This is a short video about some basics of writing for the trombone. The trombone, like all brass instruments, has roughly a two octave register that um, is its kind of the center of our range where we get the most breathable sound and um, can essentially do all of the same things on pretty much all the notes in terms of articulation and connection and flexibility. Um, and for the trombone, that register is between the B flat at the bottom of the bass clef and the B flat in the treble clef. We can play roughly an octave in either direction from that, um, going up and down, but there are certain um, registral uh, limitations that come into place in terms of articulation or dynamics or um, flexibility in terms of ease of changing notes and things like that, that um, are registrally spe specific, whereas pretty much all brass things will just work in about that two octave register. For this specific um, residency, we ask that you don't go above uh, the C, that's just a whole step above that B flat. The reason being is we're both recording in relatively smaller rooms and above that gets really tricky to record in smaller places. So we just ask that you limit the register to about that C to give the best results to y'all. Um, for the trombone, um, we're based off of an overtone series like all brass instruments. So um, if you just stay in one slide position without moving your slide, you just get a basic overtone series. <laughs> trombone slide is a tritone in length, so we, if you um, gliss from the beginning of our slide to the end of the slide, that is uh, one tritone from B flat down to E. So we essentially have a selection of overtone series based within that tritone. The reason I bring that tritone up is everyone likes trite glissandis for the trombone, um, but we can only play true glissandos, glissandis that don't have a break in them, um, essentially if they fit within that tritone, so not just under a tritone in length, but fitting in between a B flat and an E overtone series, and that's the limitations of our glissandos. Um, and that's one of the things I always tell composers, I encourage you to just make a chart that has the B flat overtone series and then the E overtone series, um, a tritone below it, and just check all of your glisses for that, because then you can basically do anything else with a trombone, but if a trombone player looks through their part and sees that all the glissandos work, you'll get generally a lot more cooperative players because they go, okay, this person thought about it. So I always encourage people to do that. Um, for the trombone, generally speaking, and this works for most brass instruments too, the lower you go, the, the kind of the more of diffuse sound you get, slightly more tuba-like, and as you go higher, the more, um, strident and martial sound you get a bit more like a trumpet. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just play a couple of simple articulations on um, my fundamental B flat and then those three B flats that are in that two octave register so you can hear the differences in range. <laughs> space like this there's a lot more edge on those high notes um, those are notes that project a lot even at soft volumes they kind of just go um, and they tend to be more likely to have kind of some barbs on the articulation but in a larger room it kind of rounds that out so hence why we're asking to keep the range down just slightly for the sake of this specific project um, and on the trombone it's an instrument that's been made to imitate the voice so um, if you think color-wise and articulation-wise, like you're writing for a tenor voice in terms of the styles of articulation, um, you get something similar with the trombone. So do and toe give you a do and toe sound. So we're very much like the voice and a guide I always tell composers, um, particularly if you're writing um, more 
traditionally functioning parts is if you can sing your part um, relative to your own voice type, it'll work on the trombone. If you can't, you might want to just consider how that's working because we're very much designed to imitate the tenor voice. Um, and if our part works on human voice, it'll generally speaking work on the trombone. A couple of the basic and standard modifiers of the trombone are mutes. You can see some on the wall behind me. Um, and the most standard mute that uh, people write for is what's called the straight mute. If you just write mute or sore, as you see in most of the orchestral repertoire, this is what you'll get, which is a metallic straight mute. Um, it doesn't make the trombone much softer. It essentially acts as a filter. So it takes those same couple of notes and it basically just ramps up the high frequencies. It doesn't make it so much softer. Um, it just makes us a little bit harsher sounding. It can function softly. That exact same volume of playing without the mute. So it's not a significant effect on the volume. It's really a timbral thing. And that harshness really comes out in um, those Sandi writing and things like that. If you want a really good example of effective use of both straight mutes and glissandi, check the orchestral works of Bella Bartok. They'll give you a really great indication of kind of the coloristic aspects of how this mute affects the sound. Um, also, generally speaking, I always tell people in terms of writing glissandi, if you want just good guides on how to use the glissando, um, Bella Bartok's orchestral works are a great guide on just really effective um, glissando writing. The only glissando in all of his writing that doesn't work is the, um, the big low B to F gliss in the uh, Concerto for Orchestra, and that's simply because it was written for an F bass, which is a different instrument than we use now, so it worked when he wrote it. Uh, but it's a great example to follow. Um, and another important thing about the straight mute is it doesn't really have any sort of registral limitations. It works basically everywhere on the entire instrument. Um, the other mute, one of the other mutes I want to talk about is the Harmon mute. Um, it's what's often, or what Weston and I often call wine mutes um, or, or filter mutes, so you can filter the sound. Um, so that this mute without any whine or filtering. So you can already hear it's a le much less harsh sound than the straight mute and it does soften the instrument somewhat. Um, and then we have, um, this is often, it's called the stem. So if you want this sound, you are writing for a harmon mute with stem in um, and you use the left hand. You can use it for fast types of motion. Kind of thing. Um, or you can do slow filtration. stem in doesn't have any specific registral limitations. The only one is our pedal B flat. For some reason, it just does not work on the Harmon mute with it open. If you close it, no problem. It works just fine. And it works without or throughout the rest of the register. Um, the one specific thing to bring up about the Harmon and the other two mutes that I'm going to talk about is that the trombone, as you notice, has this valve. It's called a tenor bass valve. So what that does is on the trombone, you play your glissando from your B flat down to your E. And then you have a gap of a tritone down to pedal B flat. And the pedal register, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, the valve helps feel, um, fill that register. So it gives you E flat down to C. Um, my valve is 
the bra on right now. So no, normally you have a seat. Um, but you, the one thing that is missing from that is anything below that C down to the B flat. So any form of lowered C, B natural or raised B flat doesn't exist on the tenor trombone. On a bass trombone with two valves, you got all that, but we're just tenor trombone players. Um, uh, apologies, I keep looking off to this side because where it's where the monitor is, just making sure that I haven't wandered out of the camera. I don't do a lot of video things. Um, the reason I bring that up is one, it gives you these valves very lovely and gives you access to a lower register, but that lower register is not an option when you're using a Harman mute um, or the other two mutes that we'll talk about because you need the left hand to do the wawing and you also need the left hand to operate the trigger. So just know that the, essentially that, that extra low register disappears when using some of these mutes because of the need for the left hand. The other version of Harman mute is the stemless Harman. Uh, this is a really effective uh, way of making the trombone much softer. <laughs> Much softer, much rounder sound in the middle register gives you especially a nice round there. The only issue with the stemless harmon is um, the second partial, which is that B flat at the bottom of the bass clef to the E of tritone below, just doesn't work. Um, for an example, this should be a fifth. That's about as good as you can get it. We'll go down a little bit. You get so you kind of just have no center. Those that B flat and that A flat were those some pretty serious face fixes. Um, so you just don't really have that register with a stemless harmon. If you're playing with a um, and you're playing in the pedal register, works just fine, no problem. Um, and it makes a very lovely soft low sound. Um, the one thing about that second partial though is if you are playing in like a triple piano um, or lower register, it actually works just fine because essentially you're, you're playing below the resonance of the instrument. So while my low B flat may sound like garbage, if I play it very softly, and the uh, same thing with that low F sharp I tried to play that didn't work at all. not even close to an F sharp pitch wise, but it has a very lovely um, soft timbre to it. Um, and that's really only like triple piano and below it works. Um, and in the pedal register, it's a really nice soft low sound. Um, so that's some basics of the Harmon mute. When we get to a couple of the other things that we're gonna talk about, we'll go back to it. The other two mutes that we are going to mention for this are the plunger mute. Everyone's seen these. It falls into the same problem as the Harmon mute, which is to say that you need the left hand, so your valve becomes out of bounds. You get the idea. Um, the thing to note with the plunger versus the Harmon while the Harman sustains a steady pitch and filters its content, the, um, the plunger mute changes the pitch that you're playing. So if you're writing music that's really pitch specific and you want some really, um, you don't want a lot of variation with the filtration that's happening, I would encourage a a harmon mute instead of a plunger mute because it will cause some pitch changes. The other um, mute that we wanted to talk about is not a mute at all, but is a CD. 
It's a really effective way of just getting some nice noisy effects on the trombone. And essentially you just push it across the bell as a vibrating membrane. And the more pressure you apply while playing, the more um, of an effect you get. <laughs> It's a nice one. It also becomes very percussive on the bell. There's a lot of options with these. Um, and they also work well in conjunction with um, the Harmon Ute. Because you can essentially use them to live. It gets a nice, just kind of aggressive popping sound when you use the two of them together. Um, okay, so the next thing we want to talk about a little bit is uh, our, our air sounds, which is essentially just um, brass instruments are a, what's called a lip reed instrument. So your, um, your lips are the reed that cr creates the vibration, and then the instrument is a resonator that makes that sound be amplified. Um, if you don't create vibration, instead using your air and you um, put it through the instrument, then the instrument can amplify and resonate those sounds. Um, these sounds function off of friction, less so than air movement. So sometimes you'll see things like turn the mouthpiece around and stuff like that. That's not really how these sounds actually work and project. They're about creating friction and airspeed in where this air enters the mouthpiece. Um, and essentially with this, any sound that you can put through the instrument can be amplified and modified by it. So a basic air sound. Um, and as you change the resonance of the instrument, it changes the resonance of the air sound. Within that, the proximity to the mouthpiece, as well as um, the interference within it, changes that sound. So if I move my air in and out of proximity with the instrument, it affects the sound, and if I move it side to side, Then from that, there are a few additional modifiers. One is creating additional friction within the mouthpiece. That's done essentially by using the lip to limit the amount of airflow that can move through the mouthpiece. And essentially, it's a way of getting a very loud, essentially fortissimo air sound. Another modification is to use the um, the uh, flutter tongue, uh, which is just essentially rolling the R while doing air sounds. <sighs> essentially what that's doing is it's using the tongue rather than the lip to put vibration into the instrument, which activates some of that resonance, which is why you hear that little bit of pitch sound when you do it. If you use something like Harmon Mute that more effectively focuses the sound, you get a much more clear sense of pitch. So you can kind of hear that slight pitch movement um, based in the fluttered air sound. Um, and that brings us to some basic percussive sounds, which is essentially using the instrument as a resonator while making percussive sounds into it. The most common of these is a slap tongue, which is essentially just slapping your tongue down either into the bottom of the mouth or through the lips and into the mouthpiece. Um, you can use that to get various dynamics and levels of aggressivity. Um, and when you slap the tongue down, it activates the fundamental frequency of the instrument, which gives you a sense of pitch. 
So here's just a nice basic slap tongue. Um, and I'll be moving the slide down essentially in a scale so you can hear it. three pitches I use the, the valve to my E flat D and C series um, and so you can hear it has a basic resonance um, and the essentially think of slap tongue is the softer you go the quicker it can be repeated um, and the louder it goes the slower the repetition because the larger the tongue motion um, generally these are notated um, with the same notation as the Bartok pits and much like a Bartok Pitts, a loud slap tongue has a slow speed. A loud slap tongue is something just like this. Probably clip the mics. Um, and that is as soft as the slap tongue can be, can be quite soft. Um, so you can, what I was doing there is doing a soft slap tongue at a rapid speed. So exhaling and then inhaling. And that gives us two different results. The reason the loud slap tongue cannot be done very quickly is when I'm doing the soft one, it's just in the mouth. When I do that loud slap tongue, it's like, where I literally spit my tongue into the mouthpiece. So there is some recovery time that needs to occur when you do something like that. Um, and then, uh, and these kind of things can be air sounds and um, these percussive sounds can be integrated into the playing. So it doesn't have to be um, do this sound and do that sound. I'll, um, once I'm done talking about some of these things, I'll do just a short, um, a very short improvisation so you can just hear some of these things mixed together. Um, some of the other ones are clicks and pops. One of the basic ones is just taking a slide. My valve isn't very loud. Weston's is quite loud though. So you can get um, some loud percussive sounds um, via the instrument that way. And you can also just get them via the mouth, anything like the tss, tss, any of that, into the mouthpiece, any of that kind of stuff goes through the instrument and is um, amplified by it. Um, and then uh, some basic, uh, oh, before I talk about this, let me talk about um, pedal tones because I said I would. So pedal tones um, are just our fundamental frequencies. Um, for this, you can probably write down to about the pedal F. So uh, down a fourth from, which is the B flat, a step below cello C. Um, these are, um, think of them like the, um, the foot pedals on an organ, right? They give us a nice round sound. But they require a different type of dexterity. So they're, um, they're much slower. We can't be as flexible, articulate as much, or sustain as long on our pedal tones. Um, if I, at a moderate volume, that's about as long as I can hold that pedal B flat. My middle B flat, for example. Probably sustain that a bit longer. So you get the idea the pedal register is much shorter durations. If you play soft, you can play them longer, um, but not that much longer. Um, the, we are a bit limited in terms of our articulation. They tend to be a little gluey. Um, you can see when I'm doing it, my jaw kind of drops. So imagine trying to speak with your mouth all the way open and how unclear that gets. It gets a similar idea. And each, the power reduces, which essentially each half step you go lower and the durations decrease and the clear that lack of clarity increases so 
So that pedal F makes a nice, really round sound, but it doesn't, um, it can't go anywhere near as loud as the pedal B flat. Um, so there are some limitations in that register, but they do make these very nice pads. The other thing I wanted to discuss are multiphonics. So multiphonics um, essentially um, exist in three basic categories, um, or really two with some subsets. One is a vocal multiphonic, singing either above or below the pitch, which are two different sounds, or a split tone, which is a type of lit multiphonic, which is essentially a multiplicity created by the lips. Um, so for vocal, vocal multiphonics, um, they function either two ways. One is essentially pure singing pure intervals or singing um, interference. So to sing a pure, or a, we'll start with an interference, it's essentially singing the same pitch and moving them slightly apart. Um, and then a vocal multiphonic um, as a pure interval. just for a little bit more clarity. Um, so you can hear there's a lot of activation of the sound that happens there, but you can kind of still hear that it's a voice. I'm gonna reverse that now and I'm gonna sing the lower pitch and play the higher pitch. is fourths, fifths, octaves are fine everywhere. If you want thirds and fifths, try to write them in the overtone um, a, uh, a major third. Try to make sure that that major third exists somewhere in the overtone series on the trombone. Otherwise, the resonance notes that exist in its sort of natural inharmonicity will interfere with the clarity of the multiphonic. Um, for example, like a major third, um, if I off that F, there's a B flat resonance node there, so it's not going to want to resonate. You hear all that interference. If I go and play it essentially on my F series where there is an A, And then the other, uh, the last segment of this is just about split tones. Um, a split tone is essentially made by buzzing two adjacent partials. Um, if you go to my website, which I can send, I've got a, um, a book on this with a chart. Um, and the chart is really expansive, but for this we're asking that you write essentially split tones that have a top pitch between the B flat at the top of the bass clef and the D um, in the bass clef, so that sixth, and um, what those sound like, right there. This is off the B flat, so B flat to F below it, which is a fourth to three split tone. Um, and that same split, or that same top pitch with a different lower note, this is a B flat and uh, G flat. Um, so it gives you just an idea of how they can change. And then as you go lower, they get just basically slightly rounder. So here's that D, um, that's the will be the bottom one in that chart. Um, and this is a D and a G. So we'll call, we'll call it the three to two split tone. You know, we call them three to twos, but um, they that's essentially the logic of how they're produced. Um, but because of, of some inharmonicity issues on the trombone, 
those actual pitches don't sound as you can hear it's not really a three to two it should be a fifth it's it's much narrower closer to a tritone um and these kind of things can be fairly loud they can also be relatively soft um and they work well with all of the mediums um and please let us know if you have any questions thank you